new social actors in the pluralist challenge to statutory law. Professor Salcedo Rapoles is a director of graduate courses at the uh, law school of the Universidad Federal de Minas Gerais. She has a master's degree in social and political philosophy and a doctor's degree in constitutional law. And so her interests overlap a great deal with the research that's been going on in the center this year. And uh, we're honored to have her here. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Salcedo Rapoles. And uh, I call on you to take the floor. <laughs> Services that are given to the community, 
And these services are, are always done through a diagnosis of the situation, which uh, demands research. Uh, once the research is, um, uh, is shared with the community and thought with the community, we plan a several actions, extension actions, that are planned together with the community, and we execute these actions. Once the actions are executed, we um, do a new diagnosis, thinking of things that research at the first time did not reveal. And uh, through this new um, evaluation of the, of the results of the extension, we plan new kinds of research that are necessary. So uh, basically, what we try to do in, in uh, um, thinking of a methodology is uh, to unite the research with the extension uh, works. So um, one feeds the other, right? Well, it's it's uh, uh, always a two-way, um, um, uh, it always um, brings two ways uh, of, um, of feeding one another, right? So research is not done, the agenda of research is not done by the researchers because of their interests, but by the demands that the community brings uh, for university. Well, uh, the, uh, working in this research program, research and extension program, Polish Visitadania, which has existed in our uni university for 19 years now, uh, we will do 20 years next year. Um, we had an opportunity to think about the uh, what theory of law, what philosophy of law has served as a basis for our um, uh, for our educational purposes in university. What are what are we teaching? What kind of law are we teaching? In a country like Brazil, where the inequalities are very present in the day-to-day -day basis, we have, uh, they are very clear, and at the same time, they are, they are invisible, because we are so used to these inequalities that we, we cannot see them anymore. Right? They, they become something very naturalized in our uh, lives. And we have seen through this research the reflections of this in the effectiveness of fundamental rights. So my paper um, tries to think of this kind of uh, problems. When we have uh, contact with these communities which are not made, uh, are not composed by the typical client of the juridical system. What does this reveal to the legal system and how it works? Uh, I have uh, prepared uh, this um, presentation based on two experiences, which I am using just a, as an example, two experiences of this ground research. Um, to think about one of the problems we have identified in, in, in our research, which is the way statutory law is used in a legalistic uh, paradigm in law. Um, in a way that this uh, formal, very abstract kind of understanding of law has been used to make more profound, to deepen the, 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 the differences in society. Instead of um, uh, creating mechanisms through which we could uh, promote more equality in society. So suddenly we realize how law has the capability of not bringing equality and liberty to people but can be used, on the contrary, 
for domination. How, how can we work with this tension in law between uh, um, arguments in law that can bring emancipation and arguments in law uh, through a very uh, similar logic can bring the op opposite result, which is domination. Well, uh, I will um, present this. I, I, pre I prepared this text, which uh, um, I will read to you, uh, because I think it, it gives me the chance to to follow a, a line of a line of um, uh, of, um, of thought that could be more clear to you, since I have this limitation with the with the language itself, you know, uh, to express and to think about uh, the ideas in English. Uh, while I speak to you right now, I am translating every word <laughs> that I speak. So. Uh, it is very difficult to to do this. Um, well, so I, I wrote the following. The, the starting point of the Polos de Cidadania research program in the Federal University of Minas Gerais is the lack of effectiveness of fundamental rights on a day-to-day -day basis. This lack could be understood, on the one hand, as a generalized disobedience of the basic law system and on statutory law specifically. And this phenomenon has been described by sociology as anomie. On the other hand, it also involves the lack of application or the selective application of statutory law by public officials. Our paper aims to discuss the live experiences that we have observed in the ground research uh, taking into account the thesis that there is an exhaustion of the legal list paradigm, that this paradigm conceals pluralism in, inherent to the legal order, and that a path out of this deadlock involves the questioning of the functions of statutory law in the legal system. The problem we, uh, we identified is that statutory law when converted into a primary social control in the 19th century, constructed a series of presuppositions that can no, no longer stand. First of all, such a paradigm ignores the dynamics of the application <coughs> of statutes and its hermeneutical character. Second, it conceals the political consequences of decision-making. Uh, we will analyze this two, two aspect, aspects, but first we must mention the presuppositions that support them. In order for such a system to work as a primary social control, it would have to offer a complete or at least a high standard of transparency between the citizen and the legislature. Uh, it's under this presupposition that the democratic political system in modern societies rose questions about the efficiency of representation and the limits and possibilities of direct participation in democracies. Uh, the legalist paradigm also presupposes that statutes have a message that is accessible to all. This access is understood in two ways. The access to the statutes themselves, that is, the capability to know that these laws exist and that they are valid, and the access in, a, in the sense of understanding what is written in the statute, its meaning, the obligations and the rights that are imposed by the text. In addition, Statutory law as a primary social control presupposes that social relations are standard. In fact, the paradigm of written codified law carries a claim of universality which ignores that society is by definition pluralistic. 
and that pluralism is an accentuated feature in contemporary complex societies. Nonetheless, the legalist paradigm claims um, that the text can capture reality in its wholeness and, and understands this reality in, um, in, in the standard way. Uh, we believe that uh, many of the interpretation that is uh, currently given um, in law uh, tries to think of the conflict as a conflict between private interests and public affairs. Uh, thinking of the state as the one who can speak of public affairs and private interest uh, uh, has to do with the individual. But we, we are uh, calling attention here is that many of these conflicts involve uh, ways of lives that have a public claim. Uh, these uh, ways of lives that are thinking not only uh, or are trying to answer not only the question, what do I want for me, for my life, but what do we want for the life of the community, of our, our society as a whole? What are the principles that are going to sustain the society? So these conflicts are not uh, necessarily uh, being opposed to the state, but they are still public conflicts. So we have public conflicts, that not necessarily involve the state. Or it involves the state and involves other questions of how um, uh, this society is going to sustain itself through certain values. So these values um, show us that these conflicts are not only conflicts of interest, they are conflicts of rights. So there are conflicts that uh, speak of how do we, what do we want for the community as a whole. And uh, we, we have found that many times law is not sensible to this kind of conflict because it interprets any conflict that, that, that comes up as a conflict between interests and a, po and a public policy that is uh, monopolized by the state. Well, um, in consequence, uh, legalist paradigm assures that all the solutions to social conflict are found in the state. That is, the presupposition of a homo homogeneous standard society is translated into the legal system as if it took was a monistic closed system. And this also happens not only in law, it happens in the study of politics, of economics, and of many different social aspects. Using examples of ground research done by Polos de Cidadania in the periphery of the state of Minas Gerais, uh, it is possible to observe how experiences help us reformulate the traditional presuppositions of the theory of law based on the legalist paradigm and advance, advance towards uh, comprehension of law uh, that can be called pluralistic or dialogical. This transition involves the questioning of the role played by statutory law in the application of the legal system, especially as this application is demanded by a public that is not the typical respected client of the system. The recognition of new social actors in public policy change the meanings of the legal statutes, uh, change the capability to the, for these statutes to regulate social behavior, and, re, and reveal non-legal non social variables that interfere directly in the application of law, uh, which, in my view, shows the unsteadiness of legalist paradigm. Uh, as we show the, this crisis of uh, the legalistic um, paradigm, uh, we will present the role we suggest 
that statutory law must play in order to be more efficient in the context of contemporary societies. Two roles will be specially analyzed. Statutory law as due process. This is written law contributes to establish conditions for the formalization of relations when this is demanded by social actors involved. The symbolic force of written uh, lends legitimacy to polit political actions and stabilizes, stabilizes the mutual behavior expect expectations. So what, what we were saying is we are not simply discarding the idea of statutory law, but uh, we're trying to think of other functions that it should play in a democratic, pluralistic society. Um, and one would be exactly this idea that the written law has a symbolic importance because it, 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 um, it stands for this, um, um, for a basis that people have as, as a starting point uh, to defend uh, their, their behavior expectations. The other role that we will be will, will uh, be approach is that statutory law is a value basis in a way that social actors may protect their worldviews and discuss what they what are their differences and common grounds, utilizing a minimum group of directive principles that they agree to share in order to make the discussion possible. Finally, our paper uh, suggests a path or a methodology that makes the transition of paradigm an open and inaugural process. Our suggestions, suggestions constructed in the period of 19 years research uh, with the involvement of numerous professors from different areas such as law, psychology, theater, philosophy, social science, architecture, communication, economy. Uh, we have a solid technical assistant team, which is as inter interdisciplinary as the first. And most important, several generations of students who change their view of law and assume a different posture in their professional life as they learned the consequences of centuries of a legal system that perpetuates inequality and prejudice using a technical and impartial discourse. And in, con in contrast, found a way to practice law in a way that it may open society to emancipation, subjectivity, and citizenship. Accordingly, the path suggested begins with a map of discursive and nonviolent forms of conflict solution in a way of a sociological analysis. Afterwards, the recognition and the communication with such forms, which we find in the communities themselves. So we don't, we, we do not start from the state legal system. We start from the principles and values of conflict resolution that are already present in that community. And, and then from this uh, diagnosis, we find uh, ways to communicate with these forms. And one of the best ways to communicate with these forms is through the language of art and theater. This is the way uh, People talk about their problems. So we have in our team um, uh, the, the law students and uh, all the students from other, uh, other colleges. They participate in a theater. Um, how do you say that? Marcelo, help me. Um, where you have a, uh, a play? Yeah, they make the play. They, they, may, they are actors in the play, and they also write the plays, write the plays. Uh, which are plays that uh, talk about the ineffectiveness of rights. And in this place, 
they take many of the speeches that they have heard in the research from the community and contrast them with the uh, state uh, legal system. And uh, through this place, after each play, uh, people from the community sit with uh, our students and professors to discuss the content of the play. And what do they think of this content and, and of the problems that are arising by the play. And we have found that this strategy is the best strategy to talk about very difficult uh, violations of rights, such as sexual, sexual harassment against uh, children, or police violence in the favelas, which are uh, kinds of themes that are not very easy for a person just to come up uh, with a strange person and, and start speaking and say, oh, the, uh, by, uh, police uh, uh, violence here is like this and like that. They, they don't just come up and start speaking of these problems. So theater is a way to do this. Uh, third, we establish partnerships, uh, and these partnerships that we choose are always um, chosen through the collective organization. So we try not to um, uh, think of these problems as individual problems, but always as collective problems. And we discuss the problems and possible solutions. Through this discussion, it is possible to make explicit the political character of statutory law and the necessity to find institutional and non-institutional ways of making rights effective in circumstances of profound and permanent right violation. Finally, we refuse to idealize the non-official forms of conflict resolution that is, the necessity to do a permanent revision of social and political practices using critical methods of violence diagnosis. Because in many ways, we are um, trying to think of how the legal system can be very excluding, even though it uh, thinks itself as a way to promote equality and liberty. Uh, on the other hand, the social practices can also be very excluding and, and uh, tyrant. So this has to be um, always uh, put into a critical lens. Thus the methodology is circular. Research leads to extension actions and they, they feed new themes, themes for research. Well, uh, the first case, I, I, I'm just going to explain these two cases and what happened in these conflicts and, and how we thought of these conflicts. Uh, so we can go to a second part of the presentation where we can speak and, and I, I can answer some questions or listen to your observations. Um, in Belo Horizonte is a city located in the state of Minas Gerais, which is one of the richest uh, parts of Brazil. It's the southwest of Brazil. Uh, Minas Gerais is the second most important economy uh, in, in Brazil. Uh, it only loses to Sao Paulo. And uh, Belo Horizonte is, a, is a, city, a rich city, a city which has, in general, a good standard of life. Uh, but the favelas, oh, and uh, something important also is that uh, Belo Horizonte is one of the first planned cities in Brazil. It was planned in the beginning of the 20th century. And the planification of the city was, uh, they made uh, the architects and urbanists, they made the circle, which is an avenue which we call Avenida do Contorno. The contorno means a circle. And the city was supposed to stay in this circle, within the circle. And the circle is all organized. We have a, an industrial part, a commercial part, a part where the public uh, service officers would live, uh, and uh, well, where the government will be, with, where the market would be, the university, everything was organized within the circle. Well, the city of Belo Horizonte also has today grown 
very outside, uh, much outside the circle. But when it was planned in the, in the beginning of the 20th century, everything had a place except the people that were working in the construction of the city. So these people did not have a place. Nobody thought where to put these people. So they came from many parts of Brazil to work in the construction of the city. And then they installed themselves in what we call in Brazil, Mohus. Moho is a hill. So they stayed in these hills that were outside the circle where the, where the city was planned. And they started just uh, constructing their shanty houses around these hills. Uh, Aglomerado Santa Lucia, which is one of the shanty towns that I'm going to speak about, uh, was one of the first uh, shanty towns in Brazil. It has more than a hundred years. Uh, in Brazil, in Belo Horizonte, was, it has more than a hundred years, and uh, it was installed in this hill outside the circle. So uh, in Brazil, it is common for people to say that uh, shanty town, uh, people that live in shanty towns are invaders. And I like to say that in the case of Belo Horizonte, the city invaded the shanty town because it was outside the city, and then the city started growing towards the shanty town. Uh, this place where this shanty town is located, everything around it today uh, is the best neighborhoods in Belo Horizonte. The richest neighborhoods in Belo Horizonte are around this, this shanty town. So you have all the good neighbors, neighbors, neighborhoods here and a hill with shanty town houses in the middle. This shanty town has 150,000 people around this population. Um, of course, this hill today is worth millions of dollars, millions of reales, in terms of uh, the, 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 the price of the land. You know, people could take the people from there. This will earn millions of dollars for certain companies because it is exactly in the middle of a very rich sector of, of the city. Well, we had a case in this place. So in this shanty town, Polos de Cidadania contains a mediation center. <coughs> it is in the middle of this shanty town. So everybody that has some kind of conflict, it can be any kind of conflict, from uh, conflict with your neighbor or conflict between a uh, husband and a wife, any kind of conflict, can go to the mediation center. In two, 2009, we received a, um, <coughs> sorry, we received this uh, leadership from a small villa in the shanty town. This villa is called Villa San Bento. And Villa San Bento is located um, well, I will read, I think it will be more clear. In the margins of Nossa Senhora do Carmo Avenue, which is an avenue that crosses Belo Horizonte, uh, which cuts the main neighborhoods of one of the richest sections of the city of Belo Horizonte, there is, is a small shanty town, only a few poor houses, standing, uh, starting to grow in a steep sideway, uh, side road. Uh, Villa São Bento, as it is known, has 200 families, considered the poorest among the poor inhabitants of Aglomerado Santa Lucia, a shanty town that counts approximately 150,000 people. City Hall maintains a policy of eviction using the following uh, arguments. Villa São Bento is located in a risk area easily affected by the strong rains, uh, the rain periods. It is a more recent formation than the agglomerate as a whole. Uh, the former has 100 years, the latter only 20. It is located nearby an env environmentally protected area and it could affect it ne negatively. The possession of public lands is illegal, and 
Thus, it is the duty of City Hall to promote the vacancy of this area. Uh, well, but very nearby, 200 meters, I don't know how you say that in English, because 200 meters, you, here you speak of... Uh, yards. Yards, or... About the same. Yeah. About the same. Yeah. About the same. 200 meters ahead, so it's very near ahead, from Villa San Bento, there is a big concrete construction, uh, which includes, includes a fancy supermarket, a famous vehicle dealer, and a construction material shop. This construction has two years. Uh, it has been partly uh, lifted in public land. It lacks the environmental licenses and two other uh, municipal licenses. It has invaded environmentally protected area. And part of the construction is out of the municipal parameters, especially the structures built for the rainwater control. These structures have several tubes that collect rainwater and throw it directly in some of the houses of Villa San Bento. So in December of 2009, during the rainy period, the water collected by the supermarkets fell over 20 houses located at the Villa San Bento. Five of these houses were destroyed, and the other 15 had their foundations fragilized. Five families, or a total of 30 people, lost all furniture, clothes, documents, family photos, and other personal belongings. On January 2010, the community leader approached the mediation center of Polos de Cidadania, <coughs> Uh, and he wanted a mediation between the community association and the families of, that had lost their houses and the construction firm that is responsible for the supermarket building. The mediation center approached the engineers who systematically ignored the request for a meeting. A letter signed by the professors that coordinate the research program received a positive response, but the engi engineers did not show up in, uh, in the scheduled day. Uh, see, then, the, um, because we have lost hope in dialogue, dialogue, Mediation Center staff approached City Hall and discovered the problems involved in the supermarket construction. They discovered that uh, the supermarket construction did not have these licenses that it was supposed to have. So we started pressuring, pressuring City Hall to do its job and notify the supermarket and the engineers uh, under disrespect of the municipal rules and postures. Uh, this case partially shows the crisis of rule of law. And meant to be universally valid and applied to all, rules often have a selective application in which social conditions have a definite weight. Economic, social, political difference account for the different ways of applying law. The crisis has to do with the invisibility of these differences and their impact in interpretation and application by state law enforcement organs. So if, uh, if I made myself clear, you can see that we have two constructions and they are basically in the same situation, except that the second construction, the supermarket construction, has only two years. The others have 20 years. By Brazilian law, with 20 years, you can, uh, if you have possession of the land, you can ask for property. Uh, the other one is uh, that the formal construction, or supposedly formal construction, is actually more irregular than the shanty town. But uh, when we, you try to enforce law, City Hall uses two kinds of reasoning to say that uh, law will be applied to one and not be applied to the other. Uh, so practice of law makes fragile the theoretical presuppositions of this 19th century theory of law. Uh, well, it was especially 
In the 19th century, that statutory law became uh, the main kind of social control. Both the constitutionalist movement uh, that brought a model of written constitution and the codification movement inaugurated the idea that written law ensures the practice of law. The problem is that part of the modern jurisprudence transformed statutory law into a fetish and then ended, ended up um, uh, provoking this, um, this differences, né? making a reduction of what law is. Uh, this was especially the case of countries with, which adopted the so-called uh, continental or Roman Germanic tradition. Uh, but even in common law traditions, um, juridical certainty is turned into a primary value of law in postures like uh, the or or originalist pro uh, posture. Um, the, rule, the legalist version of rule of law presupposes that statutory law is the main source of law because it deposits great trust in the relationships between the citizen and the legislature. Uh, this presupposition connects uh, statutory law. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I lost myself. Hmm. Well, I lost here. Basis. Well. Uh, the, the, what I, I think I'm going to, to stop because I, I here I, I made a confusion, but I want to speak of, of, the, of, of the basic idea that, that I'm bringing to you. Uh, when we analyze a case like, um, that, like this, uh, we, we found in this mediation process that uh, we did between these engineers and the and the um, uh, association, the community association, how law works in in two very different ways when people are poor and when people are rich. And it is in, in, in interesting that for many times when we spoke to city hall asking them to make these meetings with the three parties that is, the state, city hall, uh, the engineers, and the community. They said, well, this community is illegal, and this community is not a social actor that we should consider. So if they are in illegal, they are uh, considered criminals because they are uh, invading a, a place. We, we don't have to speak to them. But it is interesting that when uh, City Hall received federal money from taxes to do a certain, uh, 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 certain constructions nearby the favela, they spoke to these same leaders because they needed the legitimacy of these leaders in order to do these constructions. So there they recognized the leaders. But when, when, they, uh, when they involved this other conflict, they did not recognize the leaders. They ignored these leaders. Um, in this way, we are, uh, um, the resolution of this case was very difficult but at the end, through the city hall, uh, the engineers had to change this, the way the water was collected. But most importantly from this uh, result was that uh, the Villa São Bento realized that city hall had certain plans in taking the villa out because they had already constructed a, a plan to take all the shanty town out. 
As I tell you, these lands are worth very much in Belo Horizonte. And because of this conflict, in the, this mediation conflict, uh, the Vila San Bento was, uh, became aware of these plans. In the meetings that we made with the three parties, uh, they ended up saying certain things where the Vila San Bento could, uh, could understand that this was not a punctual, uh, 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 a problem that was just, in that case, uh, leading with the interest in that case, but it was a, a public policy that, that was already planned, but it was not transparent, it was not being said that they were going to take all the shanty town out. So what uh, became of this case is that after Vila San Bento passed through these problems, the city hall started accelerating uh, these evictions. And they started doing the, the following thing. They came, uh, these um, people that work in the city hall, came with the uh, red uh, paint. And while people were working, out, outside working, they came in and painted the houses, the, 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 um, painted the door, made, uh, made a mark in the door, in the houses. And when the people came back from work and asked what, was, what does that mean, this, this uh, red mark, they explained that all of the houses that were marked were going to be evicted. So this did not follow any kind of uh, uh, juridical procedures uh, in Brazil or in Belo Horizonte. You have to ask a judge to evict a person. The city hall doesn't have this power. But this was what was planned. Suddenly they saw that this was a plan for all the Shantytown. The Shantytown then organized themselves. Many of the communities there organized themselves uh, to pressure the city hall against these evictions. And uh, all this mobilization that um, occurred afterwards started with this simple problem here. So what I'm trying to point here is that uh, at the end, problems or conflicts that seem to be conflicts of interest, uh, conflicts that you look up and say, well, this is a, pro a, 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 a conflict between the interest of a supermarket or the engineers, a firm of engineers who want to construct and a conflict between these people who also have a private conflict. Uh, at the end, showed itself to be more than that. Uh, what was at stake there is how the city was going to be used. The city was constructed for whom? Who would establish how the city, uh, who will live in the city and what the city becomes? So at the end, uh, this apparently private conflict turned out to be a conflict of public uh, rights. Uh, the right to the city, the right to remain in a city where at, at the beginning people uh, were thought not to belong to. So as I tell you, these people were considered outside outsiders, right? Uh, suddenly this, the city advances towards them and they are part of the city. Now they are facing a new exclusion. But at this time, what they are uh, uh, speaking of is, well, we are already part of the city. You made us part of the city. So now we want to dictate also what the city must be. Uh, this is not a private interest. This is a collective public interest, or right. I prefer right than interest. That the city hall, even though it's a state, uh, it's supposed to be state, thus it's supposed to be public, did not, could not understand, could not visualize until the conflict was installed. Uh, well, I, I want to uh, um, open to, to discussion because 
I think it's probably like half an hour. Thank you very much. That's and uh, I, I just want to apologize to you because of, of my language, language limitation. I have, um, I am trying to express myself the best I can. But I, I hope I get the more. Thank you. There's no need to apologize. You've been very clear. And now there's an opportunity for some questions. And I see we have a question. I have one. And listening to your uh, very lucid explanation of this, uh, the first thought that ran across my mind is that, that uh, this is a a problem as old as government itself, and the first question I would ask is, who paid off City Hall? <laughs> In other words, if you look at the, the uh, sort of selective enforcement of law by those in control, those in control tend to respond very strongly to those with money. Yeah. And then the question is, and, I'm, and, and this could happen just as well in a little town in New England as it could in, a, in Brazil, uh, where, where uh, people are with money are able to persuade the government to look the other way when violations of building laws and codes and things happen. So uh, I, I wonder, you know, to what extent uh, your opinion is that uh, there's basically <coughs> Uh, a layer to this yeah. it's not just social discrimination, it includes corruption. I, I want to sharpen that question a little bit because it seems to me that actually what you're asking, you, you, you presented your paper as a challenge to legalism. Yes. Uh, but, and, and also uh, perhaps uh, an encouragement of pluralism. But the examples you gave and the things you actually demanded seemed to me to be a demand for more legalism and more universalism. In other words, the problem you gave as an example was not um, uh, law being used in a formalistic sense, but rather the absence of the rule of law. It was corruption. That was the example you gave. And what you were demanding on behalf of the people was not pluralism, but universal rights that they, that they deserve to have. So is this really a challenge to, uh, is, is the problem here formalism, legalism, universalism, or is the problem particularism and corruption? Well, um, the thing is, I don't, I don't see this conflict as a conflict of corruption, because I, it was not involved, uh, nothing was involved in terms of pain, uh, the problem, I don't think, was that. Uh, for me, the problem is how City Hall sees the city, how it understands the city. So it's not uh, something that was made through corruption, through pain. They simply look at this supermarket building and they say, this is the formal city. The city is correct, even though it was lacking several things. And they look at the shanty town. And the presupposition is, if there's a shanty town, people are illegally there. So they don't, they don't think of, uh, I think it is a, is a question of a paradigm. How do you see law and uh, for who law is? So I did not bring uh, a case of corruption. Uh, the engineers, in, in no way they paid for this. City Hall was trying effectively, uh, effectively to understand what the conflict was. Even though we all we all we have other cases of corruption, and this also happens, but it was not the case here. The case here was who belongs to the city and who does not belong to the city, and and this is a um, I, I think it has to do with our world views. And when I talk about pluralism, uh, the thing is at the end who says what the law is. Because uh, in this case, what I tried to show, maybe I, I could not express myself so clearly, but what I tried to show is that uh, at the end, the, the law principle was <coughs> in the hands of this community who could understand that they too belong to the city. That even though it, it, they don't have uh, actually this kind of arguments, uh, for example, you will not listen from a leader community saying, 
from this community leader saying, well, if I am, I've been here 20 years, the civil uh, code says that I have the right to be here as a, a proprietor. Uh, he doesn't have this information, but he has this, the sense that he belongs to the city in some way, which is a sense that, that is uh, not only absent in the city hall officials, it is also absent in these engineers. The, the engineers are not outsiders. They, they belong to the city. They belong to society. So, but they too understand that they, they um, that these people are, uh, don't deserve even a word. I don't need to speak to these people. These people don't have uh, any uh, social or juridical uh, relevance. And what these people are saying is, well, if the law says that everybody is equal, then I, I am part of this too. So uh, what, what do I call here pluralistic, or why, why do I speak of, of pluralism? Uh, I speak in a, of a pluralism in the sense that uh, the meanings that are being disputed here will not be found only in a technical discourse. Many of these meanings have to be extracted from uh, common practices. And uh, I was uh, talking to Marcelo yesterday when I arrived in, and we were speaking a little bit of how many of the things that I was planning to say might come to a common uh, law tradition as something different. Because uh, we were just speaking of this idea of the common law, or the idea of common, common as being the people, common as being House of Commons in England, or you know something uh, regular people that can speak of what is the sense of the law. And in the civil law tradition, this comes less evident. Uh, the civil law tradition has worked very much with the idea that the senses, the meanings of law, are given by technical solutions. So it's lawyers, it's judges, they have to say what the law is. Basically, uh, the state uh, has to say what the law is. And they lose the sense of other meanings that, that can be uh, constructed in very informal places, even if uh, the expression is very difficult. And this is why I, th uh, I spoke of theater, because if you, you come to these very poor communities, people will, sp will speak of this uh, rights violation, but they don't have, of course, they don't have the technical language to, to say, to express these violations. They only have a narrative of their stories. Uh, yes. Um, I hesitate to ask the question because I have to go teach a class in five oh, minutes, but I want to ask it anyway. Um, I very much enjoyed your talk, and I, I don't think that your linguistic ability impeded any of your <laughs> providing of your message, so thank you. Um, I don't know if I agree with your distinction between the common law and civil law uh, uh, paradigms here, because, you know, within the American uh, approach to sort of legal criticism and critical legal theory, we make some of the same criticisms that I think you're making about the civil law tradition. I mean, if you look at critical approaches to American law, you know, you have the same idea that uh, the law represents those who are in power and that the, the law is shaped by those who are in power and protects those who are in power. So if, if I were to apply a comparative lens to your remarks, I'm not so sure I would reach the conclusion that there's something inherent about statutory mm -hmm. law or the, um, or the civil law tradition that um, that, that makes the law more of a tool for the powerful in the civil law tradition than in the common law. Maybe you could say that because precedent doesn't play the same role that 
in a civil law system, it's even more conservative of the status quo mm -hmm. uh, than in the common law. But we have many of the same criticisms, I think, in our own common law system. Mm -hmm. Under the same time constraints, if I can add on to that before you respond. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely, I mean, what we're talking about now, you're talking about today about moving to a higher form of corruption. Tim is right about corruption. The United States doesn't have much corruption where you just pay people off. But in terms of turning the legal system into your own purposes, we have that and more. One of the most confusing things in America is that the United States Supreme Court and our courts are generally viewed very positively when they have been the principal obstacles to the, the things that you're talking about in terms of helping people generally. So no, I would say, I would add on to agree with Inca and in all of this. It's, it's, it's certainly not, it may be a political issue about who makes the law, but it's a, the basic problem is people making the law and then, or interpreting the law to their benefit, even though they're not being paid off to do it. Yeah, but, but I would say that uh, the critical legal state, I, I agree with you, I think uh, perhaps uh, the difference is that uh, the common law has uh, has made itself from a tradition that uh, it can look at the dynamics of this application and hermeneutics. And it is very rich in this sense, which doesn't mean that uh, it cannot be used also for domination. And I agree that it is also used, even though I am not from here, I don't know all the cases, but uh, we can see this. Uh, and I also think in a civil uh, law tradition, we can turn these things around. We can turn them more complex. And, but I wanted to uh, add to, to this an observation about the critical legal studies and uh, the idea that uh, I, am, I am very close to this line of thought, except that uh, I don't agree that these things happen, and I, I'm not sure again if I, I express this uh, in a way, in a more uh, profound way. I am not sure that this kind of conflicts uh, are generated by uh, a society divided between the good and the bad. You know, the, you have uh, these bad corporations that uh, on purpose organize themselves and uh, to do something uh, to exclude people. And I think this is uh, more difficult to solve exactly because it, it works uh, in a very symbolic in, uh, way that it is in, interjected in, in people, in the way people see life, see uh, the dynamics of, of the society itself. So you know, uh, at the beginning I, I told you about how um, at the end in, in Brazil at least we have become so um, used to seeing inequality that we cannot see it anymore and I think this is where it uh, becomes stronger. Uh, I think it is incredible to have a big city with uh, prosperity around this shanty town and people cannot see the shanty town uh, for what it is, you know, you just pass it and uh, it, it, it looks uh, uh, as part of the scenario. So we stop looking at it for what it is. We have time for one more question and I can see that there is a question. It may be more of an observation. Um, and first of all, I, I agree with the consensus that you've communicated yourself uh, perfectly well. I think I understood everything you said and it's been very enlightening. Uh, so here is what I think is an observation, which may or may not be helpful. Um, so it, it gets to, I think, everything that's been said. Um, if you had the civil, a civil law system in a pure form and a common law system in a pure form, neither of which exist and probably ever have, the civil law system would run almost entirely on rules that were drafted in advance with very little formal adjudication. Um, to resolve disputes, and the common law system would run entirely on case-by-case -case adjudication. Um, in such a system, um, it, in, this, it, in either system, um, the results will depend on who has the power at the relevant stage. 
Right? So in a pure civil law system, the results would depend, if it could exist, the results would depend on who had the power to write the rules. In a pure common law system, the results would depend on who had the power to adjudicate on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, one advantage, I think, that a common law system, as it actually exists, may have is that it acknowledges the fact that rules by themselves cannot <coughs> resolve particular, many particular disputes. And therefore, it actually sanctions, creates an official body whose job it is to apply indeterminate rules to particular disputes. That body has a lot of power. And as we've seen in our Supreme Court, that power can be misused. But at least it's a public process. One thing that struck me about your example is that the actual application of the rules that was going on was going on behind closed doors, mm -hmm. under the table. There was no real public process for determining whether the supermarket gets billed and whether this, the, what the water containment system looks like for determining which of the shanties gets torn down. Um, and, and I actually think that one advantage, or at least potential advantage, of what our system, which is really a hybrid system, or any system which is a hybrid system, is that it acknowledges publicly the need to publicly have a public process for applying the rules to particular disputes in particular circumstances. If I can paraphrase you for just a minute, I think what, what your point is is that the first thing that would happen in a situation like you described is <coughs> Uh, someone, for example, someone from a legal clinic of this or another law school would go into one of our courts and get an injunction mm -hmm. uh, against the building of the, uh, it would be publicly resolved in that sense. So, And it may be that, that then that just shifts the power dynamics to the courts and the powerful people still win. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily deny that that would be the case, but, but at least there is a um, a, a structure for having these disputes play out in public in a way that that may avoid some of the problems that you're describing. Yeah, yeah I think you're right. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the legal, Brazilian legal system has a very similar, similar principles of publicity, transparency as <coughs> the American legal system. Uh, many of which were imported from North America, were copied from North America, this, this basis for the Constitution and for the laws that set the idea of transparency and publicity. Uh, then uh, the problem that we are arising in, in our research is that, uh, in fact, this is not enough. And maybe people in, in, uh, in Brazil because of this, uh, this civil law tradition that uh, puts so much faith in the text, in written language, says, well, we have these principles, but then we have to specify how all of this is going to work. And they are always looking for more text and more text, when much of the problem is a, is a problem of politics, is a problem of organizing people uh, collectively so they understand that they have the power to give meaning to this test. And I think this is one of the biggest problems that we, we approach in our research and in the extension actions. Uh, we, we could go to the courts in Brazil too, as you said. But uh, we, we don't use this at first. Because when you go to the courts, you are bringing the, the you are bringing this problem, this conflict, to be solved by technical words, by technical language, which only few people know how to how to uh, speak. And when you try first, I mean the, the courts are are a way to do this. But if first you try to put people into contact and listen to, to them, to one another, even though if they have languages that are very, very different. Uh, of course, in this 
place, the uh, engineers have one kind of language, the people from City Hall have another, and these people from the community have another very different kind of, of ways of expressing themselves. But uh, we believe that this, uh, these forums are much more rich to solve the conflicts uh, because they open to other languages which are not technical languages. And then the judges tend to uh, think of the problem only uh, by the technical, as a technical problem. Well, what is the, uh, what is the statute that regulates this? And, uh, and then I have to have all this expertise to speak in a court. Uh, we have also uh, a group in our research uh, that works with this accessibility to the legal system and accessibility to courts, uh, uh, which has approached this kind of problems. Uh, the obstacles are very subtle, and this is what I'm trying to call attention to. They are symbolic, they are subtle. Uh, the, the lack of access to the court is not only a problem of having a, a university clinic do the job. It has to do with the clothes that the person is, uh, has to go to the court. The obstacle starts with that. I, I don't have any clothes to wear to go to the court, so I cannot go into a court. Uh, I don't have um, uh, the language ability to go to a court. Uh, people are afraid of the court, so uh, we have several other uh, problems that are symbolic and that work through this. So the point is, how can we um, turn the law something less technical and more day-to-day, uh, -day, uh, more common, something, a, a language, law turned into a language that anyone can use, that doesn't need translation. And then I think our institutions have to think how they can make themselves accessible to this kind of, of logic. And this is, again, why I speak of pluralism. Uh, trying to say that the law is not a monopoly of the state. Uh, it's not just a question of translation of that conflict into a technical problem, but a way that the conflict is also considered uh, in, their, in the solution that is made by other kinds of logics that are not the technical uh, logic that law poses. And there's another problem that is um, attached to this one, uh, that the law itself, the, the state law that is formal, technical, has to review also how it works. So on the, on the one hand, we empower other kinds of conflict solutions that are not state solutions. On the other hand, we have to make changes in the state solutions so they can be more open to this pluralism of meanings that society brings to the technical, uh, form, formal, and, and state uh, institutions. Well, I thank you very much you. for for this uh, exchange of ideas and um, hope to speak more and I'll, I'll stay here for, for a week so uh, if I had the opportunity to go to the classes and, and listen more to you, it would be a, a real pleasure. Thank you very much.